Our island economy has developed since the last visit and we'll return to my island now to have a look at another couple of formulae. Barter, exchanging goods without money, has been replaced with a new system in which money is a key to the exchange process. At the moment there are four of us on the island. I gather olives, Theodore grows apples, Mariella catches fish, and Damien specialises in tomatoes. The bigger the economy, the harder barter becomes. So it's easier if we all agree to accept money, which acts as a medium of exchange. Suppose we grow to be a hundred of us, each specialising in some different product. Exchanging my goods for a whole range of others is becoming increasingly tricky, so using money simplifies things. But most economies that use money find that sooner or later they have a problem. Whether they're tiny, like our island community, or a huge industrial economy, they experience inflation. In this film, we're going to see how we can use formulae to help us to understand how the government controls the economy in general, and inflation in particular. And we'll use two different formulae to help us to understand it. Each of our four community members produces some output and sells it to the others. So let's look first at the size of our island economy. The first column gives the physical outputs of the goods that are then sold in the market. We can call the total T for transactions. The total transactions T for our economy are 100, the kilos of olives, plus 125, the kilos of apples, plus 25, the fish, plus 50, the kilos of tomatoes, which equals 300. At this time, the price of each of the four kinds of outputs is 2 euros, so the average price of each transaction that we'll call P, for price in euros, is obviously 2. The value of the society's output is P times T, 2 times 300, equals 600. Alternatively, we could say that the value of the output is the sum of the value of the outputs of each of the four members of the community, 200 plus 250 plus 50 plus 100 equals 600. The total value of output produced within a country's borders is often called gross domestic product, GDP. So PT is the same as GDP. So for our tiny island we have just 600 euros of output that we exchange. But we only have 200 one euro coins. Can that be enough to make it possible to exchange all our output? The answer is yes, certainly, because the coins get used more than once in the course of the year. They get passed on from one person to another in the process of exchange. And from this simple idea, we can develop an important formula. If there's 600 euros worth of exchanges in the year, and only 200 one euro coins, then it's clear that on average each coin will need to be used three times. If we call the money stock that we have available M, where M in our case equals 200, then the average speed at which the money will change hands, which we'll call V, the velocity of circulation, is V equals GDP divided by M, or PT divided by M, which equals 2 times 300 divided by 200, which equals 3. It may seem surprising that in a large modern economy we can know V, this velocity of circulation, but if we know the total output and the amount of money in circulation, it's easy to calculate via our formula. It will be useful to rearrange our formula if V equals PT divided by M, 
and we multiply each side of our equation by the amount m, then we have mv equals pt times m over m. m over m will always be equal to 1, so we can rewrite it as mv equals pt. In our case, 200 times 3 equals 2 times 300. This is sometimes called the equation of exchange and will be true by definition for any level of output and money stock on our island, or indeed for any economy anywhere. Some people want to use this equation of exchange to explain the source of inflation in an economy. Suppose now we find that another 20 euros enters our economy. It doesn't matter where we find them, perhaps someone arrives on the island with them, but now we have more euros in circulation. Some have argued that the velocity of circulation in an economy changes slowly or not at all over time, so we can treat V as constant. If we also assume that the people on our island are fully employed, then there's a fixed annual amount of produce, and so T cannot rise. Then it follows that since M has risen by 10% from 200 to 220, and V won't change, MV will increase by 10%. Then we know that PT must rise by 10%, but T can't change by assumption, so P increases by 10% the same rate as the increase in the money supply. Checking this out, MV equals PT. 220 times 3 equals P times 300, where V is constant and T is constant. 660 equals P times 300. Dividing through by 300 gives P equals 660 over 300 which equals 2.2. An average price of 2 euros 20 cents is a 10% increase in price following the 10% increase in the money supply. So given our assumptions about V and T, assumptions not everyone would accept, the key to controlling inflation is to control the money supply. In a modern economy, the main form of money is bank credit. You buy most things not with cash, but with a cheque or debit card, which you expect the bank will honour. That credit is created by the commercial banks, and it's a multiple of the amount of cash in circulation. When a sum of cash is deposited with a bank, it will keep, say, 10% in cash to meet requests from customers. We call this 10% a cash ratio, but it will lend out the other 90%. It doesn't hand over cash to the customer, but allows someone to borrow by, say, writing a cheque, in other words, by creating credit. And this acts as money, someone buys goods with the cheque. When that cheque is redeposited with the bank, the bank will feel able to lend 90% of it by creating a further credit, a further 81 euros. If that sum is redeposited, a further credit creation takes place. Now just what's the limit to the credit the banks can create from an initial deposit of a sum of, say, 200 euros? We can show this with our second formula. D equals 1 over R times C, where D is the amount of bank deposits, R is the cash ratio, and C is the cash held by the bank or banks if there's more than one. Suppose a deposit of 200 euros cash is made with a bank, and the bank has a 10% cash ratio, then D equals 1 over 0.1, times 200 equals 2,000. Now that term, 1 over R, is called the credit creation multiplier. 
any initial deposit of cash enables the creation of ten times as much credit, money, to be created. And what is true of the level of cash is true for changes also. So delta D, where delta means change in, delta D equals 1 over R times delta C. So with a 20 euro increase in the cash base, delta D equals 1 over 0 0.1 times 20, which equals 200. The money supply rises by a multiple of the increase in cash. Although this is a much simplified economy, it does show how a government can influence the money supply and ultimately the price level. How does it operate in the UK, where of course the money is pounds sterling rather than euros? Although it's the commercial banks that create the credit, the Bank of England can control the extent to which they do it. Some years ago, the government charged the Bank of England with responsibility for controlling the money supply and interest rates. But how do they do it? One way is for the central bank to oblige the commercial banks to keep a higher proportion of its deposits in cash or some other liquid form so that they can't issue so much credit. Let's look at our formula to see what effect this might have. So suppose the Bank of England originally allowed the commercial banks to retain a 10% cash ratio, but now says the commercial banks must keep a 20% cash ratio. The original bank multiplier was 1 over R equals 1 over 0 0.1 equals 10. So a cash deposit with the banks could enable the banks to increase the money supply by 10 times that amount. But the new one is that 1 over R equals 1 over 0 0.2, which equals only 5. So the power of the commercial banks to create credit has been much reduced by the change in the required cash ratio. Of course, our desert island economy is so much simpler than a fully functioning market economy, but our formulae do give insights into the way an economy functions. We shall use more complex formulae in later films, but the principles are always the same. If the use of formulae is uncomfortable, when you're faced with one, don't panic. Take your time. Break it into steps. Your confidence is sure to grow. My advice would be to break it down into smaller steps. I think what often happens, people see a very complicated formula on a page and freeze. Break it down into small steps. Learn each one and put them together at a pace you can cope with. <laughs>